My friends at Easy Cater are workplace catering pros, helping you find food for everything from daily employee meals to staff meetings and special events. Visit easycater.com slash leader assistant to find out more. Hello, I'm Vicki Sokol Evans. Today's leadership quote comes from John Wooden, who's the former UCLA basketball coach. It's what you learn after you know it all that counts. The Leader Assistant Podcast exists to encourage and challenge assistants to become confident, game-changing leader assistants. Thank you for listening to the Leader Assistant Podcast. You're listening to episode 60. And here's your host, my data. Hey friends, it's episode 60. I'm very excited to have made it this far. Keep cranking along. Got lots and lots of interviews in the hopper coming to you every week over the next several weeks, uh, really a few months. Um, Got about 35 or 40 episodes in the hopper. So I'm very excited to share all those with you. Today's a special one with Vicki Sokol Evans. Uh, I think you're going to enjoy it. But before we jump in, just a reminder that you can check out the first three chapters of my new book, The Leader Assistant, Four Pillars of a Confident, Game-Changing Assistant, at leaderassistantbook.com. You can download the first three chapters for free, uh, give you a little sneak peek before it releases on June 23rd. And yeah, leaderassistantbook.com, invite you to check it out. Shoot me an email, let me know what you think, or find me on LinkedIn or Instagram or in our Slack community at slack.leaderassistant.com. I hope you can check it out. Let me know what you think. And I'm really excited, if you can't tell, to launch it. I've been working on this for a long time, um, and we're coming up close to the launch. So leaderassistantbook.com. Hey, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to the Leader Assistant Podcast. I'm excited today to be speaking with Vicki Sokol Evans. Vicki, how's it going? Great, Jeremy. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited. Well, let's jump right in and chat about your very first job and maybe what skills you learned in that role that you still use today. Yeah, I think, you know, I've been listening to your uh, your podcast and I know a lot of people because you mentioned like, what is your first like, <laughs> like legit job? I mean, obviously, just like anybody, I started as a babysitter, <laughs> uh, but my, le- my first legit job where I got a paycheck and paid taxes on uh, was with Swenson's ice cream in the mall. And I'm pretty sure I lied about my age. I think you had to be 16. I was 15. Uh, just like a lot of your guests have mentioned before. And, uh, I had an amazing manager. His name was Farhad. I'm still in contact with him. We're on LinkedIn. Uh, we're connected on LinkedIn and he was just a really great role model for me and instilled, uh, my work ethic, I believe. I just really enjoyed going to work and being with my friends and just making friends with the people I worked with. So I'm really grateful for him. He, he, um, he also taught me the value, the, the value of a scoop of ice cream. Cause I remember this one day when this woman came up and she had a couple of kids on her hips and, and she says, well, what is, how much is a scoop of ice cream? And I said, well, it's 90 cents, ma'am. And she yelled at me. She said, 90 cents, 90 cents for a scoop of ice cream. And she was just yelling at me. And I couldn't believe it. I just wanted to just cry. Like, it's not my fault. It's 90 cents. And to this day, when I go get a scoop of ice cream and they charge $3 for it, <laughs> I just giggle and, and think about that woman. And I certainly don't yell at the person behind, you know, at the, behind the counter. But it just makes me giggle and I'm happy to pay $3 just because it brings me back to that moment when um, she yelled at me for 90 cents. Like we could, if we could only go back to a 90 cent scoop of ice cream, that would be wonderful. (laughs) Yeah. A lot of the problems in the world would be solved, right? (laughs) Right. Exactly. All of them. (laughs) (laughs) Awesome. Well, could you maybe share an overview of your career from that 90 cent ice cream cone uh, and then a little bit of your story uh, that's brought you to where you are today. Um, 
Oh my gosh. So I'm just going to keep it short and sweet. So I, um, I was actually working as an assistant at a radio station in the nineties. It was, uh, when like December, 1993. So a long time ago. And I remember having this electric typewriter and I also remember being introduced to Microsoft office and I, the light bulb just went off and I knew the impact that these software programs were going to have in this environment. And, um, I've always been a natural teacher. I, so growing up, I'm one of five kids. I've got, I'm the middle of five kids of two older brothers and two younger sisters. So as the older, oldest daughter, I would um, teach my younger sisters, and if they were not available or willing to be taught, then I would teach this, the stuffed animals that were in the area. So I would just gather everybody and just start teaching. Um, and anytime the teachers at the end of the year would throw out all of their curriculum, I would gather it up and take it home and teach everybody. Um, so I just had a natural, like I had kind of this natural love and passion for teaching, but then when I was working as the, this assistant with all this technology, I just saw the impact it was going to have on our ability to, um, to save time and be more efficient. And then all of a sudden, when people had questions about how to do something in Word or Excel, I would just naturally help them. I became the subject matter expert of the SME. And um, then in 1997, a friend of mine said she was going to be a trainer um, at a training company that teaches all day word classes, all day Excel classes, all day PowerPoint classes. I'm like, Oh my gosh, I would love to do that. And so I was back in 90, 1997 when people went to word introduction and word intermediate, I was the trainer. Um, and I've been doing that from 97 up until today off and on. Like I would take a break, be an assistant, be a personal assistant, executive assistant, legal assistant, but I always fell back on my technology training background. So that is my kind of pathway. But I like this saying, I don't know if you've heard of this, is where they always say, um, luck is where preparation meets opportunity. And um, I've been super lucky, super blessed in my career. Like I've had the opportunity to train Bill Gates's team, the, the team that supports Bill Gates and Melinda Gates and the, and the team and the CEO of the Gates Foundation, um, the, the assistants at New York Times, assistants at, uh, in parliament. I've been really, really, really fortunate, but it has to do with my preparation, like getting the skills to be a really good trainer. Um, and, also, my background is an improv comedy performer. So I studied and performed comedy in New York and in Texas and Austin. But then also the opportunity, like um, collaborating with Bonnie Lowe Craman and um, other collaborators around the world, like Lucy Brazier and ELS Forum and, and you, Jeremy, and, and just um, knowing about like how valuable these partnerships are to create opportunities where I can be speaking and have Bill Gates's assistant see me speaking and then invite me to train her team. So, um, so anyway, I've been really fortunate that way. Hmm. So yeah. how did you get to when, you know, you've trained people on Microsoft tools and productivity tool, you know, tips and stuff. How was it always training assistants? Was it training kind of anybody? And then it kind of shifted into the assistant world. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So I, I was training everybody so at the beginning. I was training everybody, anyone that needed to come to training. It wasn't really specific to assistants because I've been an assistant throughout my career, like really weaving from the time I was a receptionist at the Texas state, uh, the department of health for the Texas, for Texas and, uh, a legal law, a law firm, and then a personal assistant in New York. So I've always kind of weaved my um, career with assistant jobs. Um, it didn't start training assistants, but when I was a personal assistant in New York in 2002, um, I left 
New York to come back to Texas to get married and start a family, I was still supporting the assistants, some celebrity assistants in New York City. And in fact, that's the reason why I named my company Red Cape is because I found out that that assistant was paying for my training services out of her own pocket. And I said, well, why are, why are you paying for me? Shouldn't your employer pay for your training, your technology training? And she said something really poignant to me. She says, well, I don't want my employer to know I don't know these skills. Hmm. And I said to her, I said, well, if you, had to, if you had to remodel a bathroom, would you do it or would you bring in someone to do it? And she said, well, I'll bring in someone to do it. So it's like, that's, this is the same thing. I'm building a wine inventory database for you. So um, your employer should be paying for this, not you. And so I, I all of a sudden saw, I said, you, I said, I told her, I said, you've got your manager, you've got your executive, I've got you, I've got your back. And so then I saw Lois Lane falling and Superman catching her. And she's, and she says, and he says, I've got you. And she says, well, you've got me, who've got, who's got you. And that's all of a sudden I realized there's superhero assistant. Sometimes technology leaves you powerless. And I'm simply the cape to, to give you that power and confidence to use the technology, to make you more efficient, to save you time and eliminate the unessential work. Um, so you can be better at supporting your executive. Mm-hmm. Um, once that happened, at that time I was coming back to Dallas and I was actually being interviewed to be an assistant, a personal assistant for a CEO. And I was the one of the last two candidates and they brought us both in individually, but I, it's, it was my turn to come in, see the office space. Um, I was going to be a personal assistant in his high rise, um, Uh, apartment in downtown Dallas, and I was going to collaborate with the executive assistant. So I'm in the kind of the high rise apartment, penthouse apartment. There's this office in here. And I am looking at my workspace thinking how to automate this, how to automate this office. And then I put my hands on the chair and realized I don't want to be sitting in this chair. I want to support the person sitting in this chair. I think um, there are so many assistants that have to work weekends and evenings to to get their work done, and they're literally one click away from being home with their families on time. And so that was when it clicked for me that I want to train assistants on how to use their technology, and I've naturally, organically moved into training their teams, marketing departments, executives, um, HR departments financial firms and so on. So that's kind of the long winded way, but it was important. It's, it's an important part of the story that an assistant is who inspired me to create red Cape Hmm. and name it red Cape. Yeah. That's awesome. So you mentioned, you mentioned trying to help that assistant see that their executive should be the one and their company should be the one paying for their training. What, what's a, a couple tips that you could share to, uh, those listening who struggle to get professional development money? So I, um, I always recommend identifying like, what does it take right now? I, 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 t- for instance, today I had five interviews with a company. I'm going to be training a seven, seven member assistant team. And I had one-on-one interviews with each one of them with about, about five of them today. And they each told me about a process, a man, a process that takes up a lot of time. It's a challenging process, a lot of redundant work. So one of the things I, I suggested that they do is identify how much time it takes you to, to do this assignment, to do this task. And I know it's always been this way to do it this way, but find out how long it takes you. What are the, what are the risks? Because any kind of manual work in these assignments or processes, anytime there is a, a mistake, it's nothing really else can be trusted in that assignment. So if someone sees a, a, a spreadsheet and looks at it and there's a mistake, I can't trust, I can't trust it. If it doesn't look professional, I can't trust it as an executive. I just can't. So, um, it's important to understand that not only are you, um, you, you're needing to eliminate unessential work and, waste, but you also want to produce, um, a really good product. 
So capture how long it takes you currently to do something and then find out how long it should take you, um, which you can attend different free webinars, my webinars and different things like that. But if you can calculate the ROI on the difference between not being in trained, being trained or being trained, that is going to be a huge thing. So anytime you go out and get attend any kind of training webinar, whether it's free or paid, identify how much time you saved after attending that and then multiply it by your hourly rate. And you can get your hourly rate by taking your salary, divide it by 2080, I believe is the HR, the HR, um, calculation. So take your hourly rate divided by 20, 2080, and then that will give you, um, your hourly rate. Hmm. So that's, that's what I recommend. Yeah, that's awesome. So what's kind of another struggle or maybe even the number one struggle that assistants that you work with have related to the technology that they use? Um, there's so much of it. I mean, I, like I, I train assistant, I train the teams at Microsoft, not only assistants, but I also train business users at Microsoft. Um, you know, people go, well, why would Microsoft employees need training? And even Google employees or anybody need training, even if it's their own products. But technology is changing so rapidly that if we don't continue, like constantly keep up with technology, it's going to be really difficult um, to uh, be efficient in these programs. Um, you know, I, I've heard the word tech savvy. I've heard it on your podcast and I've, I hear it all the time. Like if I meet someone on an airplane, so I'll, if I meet an executive on an airplane and they ask me what I do, I tell them what I do and I'll ask them, I'll say, well, how about you? How do you keep up with your tech skills? Do you go to training? And they'll typically say, well, no, I'm tech savvy. Mm. And if someone says, no, I don't attend training because I'm tech savvy, then they're not tech savvy because any tech savvy person um, wants to constantly keep up their skills and they're curious about technology and they're resourceful, they're confident and they're continually improving their skills. So, um, the, the other thing for assistance is, you know, we're not going to be in the same position forever. Everyone leaves a job and they move, move to different positions. And I think there's some trend about, you know, um, a certain number of years that you actually work as in a particular at a particular company. I don't know what that is, but mm-hmm. uh, when you transition between different companies, one one company is going to use Google Apps, the next company is going to use Microsoft Platform, the next one's going to use Apple Platform, and the next one's going to use Google Apps. So that's going to be a really big challenge for people is um, just keeping up with the different productivity platforms, and not only the, is the operating systems. Because I know some assistants who their executive is on a Mac and now they have to be on a Mac even though they've been PC or vice versa. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's a a big challenge because these job descriptions are asking for tech savvy assistant, but they don't really describe what that means. So I think the first step for any assistant, especially looking into a new role, is if they do see that their job requires tech savviness or tech skills that they ask the employer, number one, what specific tech skills are they looking for? And number two, what type of professional development do they provide in order to keep your skills up to date? I can never, I I can't even imagine bringing somebody on my team and expecting them to be at a high level technology wise and not providing additional ongoing training for them to keep up with technology. I just, that is, that just does not work for me. They have to constantly keep up. And I have a worksheet. So if anyone is interested, I can give it to you, Jeremy. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's called the tech savvy assistant and it describes the different skills, the core skills and specialty skills, um, in detail. So I recommend like assistants sitting with their executive and say, hey, what skills do you want me to have? And then each year, what is the plan for me to build these skills and keep them up to date? Hmm. Yeah, well, I'll uh, maybe we can share a link to the worksheet uh, in the show notes. Yeah, absolutely. So speaking of keeping up with technology, what are your thoughts on artificial intelligence and how it has already started to and will continue to impact our work, especially uh, as assistants? I say bring it. Bring on the robots. Like, bring it. Um, here's, here's why. 
I have no shortage of projects that I really want to work on. And when I ask an audience uh, of, of, of assistants, a room of assistants, do you have these fun projects that you really want to work on? And the reason why we can't work on this is because we don't have time. So anytime AI or these digital assistants can um, remove any kind of the burden of our kind of um, tasks that are that can be automated, bring it. Like automate it as much as possible. The the first, I mean, I'm sure at this point, especially from from Outlook, and I'm, I'm sure you have some examples from a Google platform, but from an Outlook pl- pl- platform, when when a travel itinerary from any one of the airlines or hotels or car rentals get emailed to you via Outlook, Outlook automatically puts it on your calendar and will send you the notification reminder when it's time to check in. So that's the uh, an easy example of AI. It, it's now removed that that's one step for me to have to put that on my calendar for my assistant or anyone to put that on a calendar. Mm-hmm. Um, so I say, I say bring it. And I, I suggest that all assistants embrace it. Can just go out and find out as much information on AI as possible and how it's going to impact your role. Participate on any beta groups or focus groups within your organization about AI. Um, and then if you're worried about AI taking over your job, then I would suggest um, getting more skills in other areas so that it can take over those pieces of the job and then you can expand your skill set in other areas. Yeah, totally agree. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So uh, speaking of Office 365 versus Google Suite, Google Apps, Google Calendar versus, um, you know, Outlook and all that. Which do you prefer? So I, I use them all. So I use my, I use the Microsoft platform. I use the Google platform, Apple productivity platform. And I, and I, so that I can teach them and support my clients. Mm. Um, I, I can tell you a few statistics. So, um, m- most corporations use the Microsoft platform, um, and it also depends on the geographic areas. And um, small businesses tend to use more of the Google apps than um, than corporations. There are lots of corporations that that use Google as well. Um, for for me, my team, I've got a remote uh, team of not only vendors but contractors and employees, and we have. A combination of PCs and Mac, and we need enterprise class technology with full functionality on the desktop. So all of the the full functionality, Word, Excel, and PowerPoint, um, as well as the ability to edit in the cloud and access in the cloud and mobile access. So we use Office 365, and um, and then we also need obvious, obviously if we're working offline or online, and but really what I tell assistants is because sometimes I'll have a group of assistants in the room and I'm teaching Microsoft today and the Google people will leave. Anyone that's on Google will leave. Mm. Or if I'm teaching Google apps, then the Microsoft people, the people that are using Microsoft will leave. I tell people, no, stay because you don't know when your company could be transitioning to a different platform or if you, when you leave this role, that there's a chance that the next company will have the other platform. So it's important for you to understand that. And not only that, if you have kids um, that are in high school or college, then you can better support them and understand the platforms that they're working in. So, um, so I teach them, I teach them all and just whatever is in demand. And the most, the one that's most in demand is office 365 right now. So you probably just prefer that just based on that's what you're mostly working with, with your clients, personal um, preference. Mostly with, a, um, well, see, like I'm Mac and PC. So I've been, I've been teaching Mac and PC for since 1997. So I use both Mac and PC equally. I prefer if you're asking me, like if you're asking, like, okay, I'm <laughs> admit, I prefer a windows laptop. Okay. 
okay. over my Mac laptop. But I do use it all the time. It's always there. My kids use both Mac and PC. Um, they're, they, they know both platforms. And I'm very proud that they're using both platforms because I don't know what their workplace is. We're, we're talking about a modern workplace. And we don't know what that modern workplace looks like in two years, five years, because someone's right now building something in the garage, their garage that we're going to just not know how we ever lived without. So we have to be agile in, in what we're using. And so I'm happy to use Mac or PC, Google or Office 365 or what, whatever it is. And I encourage, I encourage assistants to just be open when they're learning, when they're at conferences, when they're listening to podcasts like this, like if there is a, if you have a podcast specifically about Google apps and they're only on Microsoft platform, listen to it. Um, because you just don't know when you're going to need that information. Um, so that's my take on it. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. I, you know, it's funny. I've been on Mac since pretty much, what was it? The iBook, I guess. Um, yeah. Right. Oh my gosh. And so, and all the the companies I worked at have been on Mac and, and Google uh, as well. And so, the thought of getting a new role at a company that was all PC and you know Office three sixty five is just kind of scary to me because <laughs> I'm just like, well, yeah, I'm like uh, and I don't almost, know if I want to do that. <laughs> it it almost leaves you powerless, doesn't it? Yeah. Like, yeah. I, like I, I don't know. I don't feel con like you, you won't feel confident. It's like I'm so familiar with Mac and Google apps that it's almost like even if it was your like, for instance, LinkedIn, Facebook, a lot of major tech firms in Silicon Valley are Microsoft based. And so if you if, there's, if anyone has a dream to work there, if you're feeling powerless, like I only know this tech, I only know the Mac and Google platform, you might not pursue that dream job. So, um, I don't want to discourage people from, from pursuing jobs. And I also don't want to burden people with having to learn all of this stuff. I just want people to be open. Um, if, if you're there and you have an opportunity to, to see and be aware of what's possible in Google apps and, uh, Microsoft technologies. I think Jeremy, you're going to know if, if you end up getting a job in a, in a Microsoft shop on a PC, you'll be fine. Um, it's just going to be a little bit of learning curve, but mm -hmm. you'll be fine because, um, you're aware of what's possible in the programs. If you're, um, making yourself available to see, see that when you attend conferences and things like that. So, yeah. um, just like absorb technology, just be a sponge and, and, don't worry about trying to learn it all. Just sit there and absorb and don't stress out. Just just sit there and observe and then, you know, get what you need. And you never know when you'll need that information. Yeah, you know, it's 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 really like learning anything where, um, you know, we uh, if we have something wrong with our, you know, shower head and I look at a YouTube video and all of a sudden I feel like, I could be a plumber after watching a YouTube video just because I observed it and I was aware right. of it. And now all of a sudden I'm, you know, a hundred times more familiar with how a shower head works than I was before. Um, and it didn't take that long. It wasn't so, yeah, the same with technology. And I talk about AI a lot, you know, working in an AI uh, company um, capacity here in St. Louis. And, you know, we're building out a knowledge sharing AI platform and I try to, encourage assistance and challenge assistance like listen like just try out ai tools sign up for like you mentioned sign up for a beta version or a or a you know early adopter program and just just be aware of it just just kind of you know play around with it for a little bit on on a lunch break and just kind of be aware of what's going on um and then yeah like you said the learning curve there'll be a learning curve but it won't be as steep as kind of the, right. the goal Right, right. It's all about awareness, isn't it? It's just like just knowing like what's out there, and that way, as soon as it's called on in a meeting, like AI or um, you know, find time, 
which is a new feature in Outlook that helps mm-hmm. you pull a bunch of people to select the right time to meet. Um, just just be aware of different things so that when it becomes relevant, then you can learn more about it when the time is right. Yeah. Yeah. So you have a book called 100 Tips uh, or 100 Life Changing Tips. Uh, I think you've got a you know you've got a PC and Mac versions. Um, tell us a little bit about what assistants can how they can use this book. Is this something that you recommend as, hey, if you ever get stuck or you're working on a certain software to jump in and, and focus on that? Or is it something that you should sit th- and go all the way through? How, how would you recommend engaging in your 100 tips books? Yeah, so I actually, I've, I've got feedback from people who read the book. And I even have Microsoft employees who have the book and they say it is on my desk. And when I know I'm like, oh my gosh, I know there's a way to separate first name and last name from the full name column, then I'll go to Vicki's book. Um, so I don't recommend reading like tip one all the way to tip 100. Mm-hmm. You can, but I think most people go, Oh, I saw this in Vicki's session. Um, so it is, so here's, here's why I created it. I was working at Microsoft as a business analyst. At one point I was, um, teaching at a law firm and I saw a, an ad for an access database, um, analyst at Microsoft and in Dallas. And I didn't even, I was living in Dallas at the time. I didn't even know Microsoft had a Dallas office. So I ended up getting the job and working at Microsoft for a couple of years as an analyst. And so I was working with millions of rows of data and, um, cleaning it up, creating all these different functions, creating pivot tables and charts. And at that time I had 15 sort of, I currently have over 20 certifications. I think I had 15 certifications at the time as a Microsoft certified trainer as well. So here I am an expert working in Excel at Microsoft. I am just like the bomb here. And it wasn't until I left Microsoft, I started writing my book and just kind of looking at things, then researching these tools that I realized that there was this button that existed right in front of my face called format as a table. And had I clicked that button, on the millions of rows of data, it would allow me to get home to my newborn son, Will, at the time. And he's now 13. But he was a newborn, and I was working 12-hour days, long hours, as an expert in these programs, and I didn't know this existed. So that's what this book is about. It's about um, even just basic skills, like even selecting a range of data in Excel, um, All of these are the most essential life-changing tips that everyone should have over the Microsoft Office platform for both PC and Mac. Uh, Eventually, I'll do a Google version as well. But um, that's going to be a year from now because I need a break Mm -hmm. But um, because this one just came out. So everyone wants more time. Nobody can argue that every single person, I don't care how much money you have in this world, everyone is craving more time. And yet we are wasting so much time, even though we have the most powerful tools in front of us. On average, we're only using 10 to 30% of our applications capabilities, uh, regardless of what technology you're using. So that means 70, 90% is just sitting there waiting for us to use. It's just such a waste. And so it's, it reminds me of when Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz finds out that all she had to do was click her shoes and, you know, three times and then go home. And yet she, she had the power to go home this whole time. And that's what this book is. It's like the Ruby red slippers. And, um, these are the tips that are going to help you get home on time. Um, so that's my goal is that, you know, go look at, you can go one at a time. Uh, Sometimes I suggest pick three things practice those, pick three more, practice them. Sometimes people look at it and go, Oh, I know she had this in her book and they'll show, they'll go to a specific tip. So it depends on how people want to use it. Hmm. Um, but I want to raise standards. I want to improve our quality of work. I want people to deliver better results in less time by using the technology they have. And that's the goal. Nice. Yeah. So Ruby red slippers and red cape goes well together, right? 
I know, right? <laughs> yeah. I think she's she's a superhero to me. Oh, I don't yeah. know. We're all superheroes, yeah. So let's get practical for a second. Can okay. you share maybe one tip for Windows PC users? Yes. So for Windows, if you're listening to this like, and you see your computer right now and you're looking down at your computer, there's a little Windows key to the left of your space bar. When you push that Windows key, that launches the start menu. And when you use that with E, like Windows E launches Explorer, Windows D launches the desk or minimizes everything and shows the desktop. Windows L locks your computer. So the win- And then if you just hit the Windows key and start typing, you can search anything on your computer. So definitely the Windows key, number one tip for Windows PC users. Nice. How about yeah. let's, let's switch over to uh, Mac. Any, any yeah. maybe a tip for Mac users? Mac is the spotlight. So command space bar. And you probably already know that. But mm-hmm. there are a lot of Mac users who don't know about command space bar. Literally just type whatever you need, an app, a document, email, um, whatever, notification, whatever you want. Mm-hmm. Windows, I mean, a command space bar is your spotlight. Yeah. Yeah, I've, I've, uh, I love that because it's kind of like Google for your computer. And so you just yeah. basically, you don't have to, this is part of what we're doing with our company capacity is we're making the information in, internal in your organization, in your company, accessible without having to know where it is and having to know which yes. which application, which document, which team member. Um, you just ask it and and type it in and you and you find it in the AI and the machine learning and the natural language processing understands what your intent is and gets that to you quickly. And so, um, yeah, it's very exciting to th- really morph into the future of not having to know where the folder is, but just going straight to the files and, and that the is information so great need. i love that and 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 that's what i would encourage all assistants to do more of is to search whether it's search email calendar search their computer search sharepoint search google apps like search 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 instead of double clicking and trying to drill down on folders yeah. is use search as much as possible because they can put their fingertips on whatever they're looking for much faster. So if there's anything like, you know, the idea like when you write with your, the you know, I'm a right-handed. So when I write with my right hand, I'm like, oh, it's so easy. Mm-hmm. I want you to start writing with your left hand, your opposite hand, and start searching. Even though it might not be natural for you to search, do it. Because once you get used to it, you'll be better at it and yeah. you'll get your hands on stuff. Yeah. Search, search, search. Awesome. All right. One more tip uh, for mm-hmm. how about let's talk about PowerPoint. So I'm actually, you know, Google Slides. We use Google Slides. Um, but, mm-hmm. you know, today I even ran into an issue where my CEO is in Vegas speaking at a conference and they're like, well, we need it. We need a PowerPoint file. And we have custom fonts. And so then I was like, okay, well, they're not going to have that font installed on their computer. So I've got to embed the font when I export the file. So anyway, even though I'm a Google user and uh, we live in Google Slides, I still had to be PowerPoint, um, you know, capable. Yes. Yeah. So what's a tip for PowerPoint? Um, so I think the, I don't know if this is going to help you. But um, the one button that's been there since the 1900s that is mind blowing, um, 1900s meaning 1990s, um, <laughs> that the is the reset button um, right next to the new slide button. To the right of the new slide button is the reset button, and what that does is when you when I copy a slide from um, from another present, let's say you give me a slide, Jeremy, and I want to drop it into my presentation. Um, and then it's not working right. When I hit the reset button, it will reset it to the template that I'm the destination template. So that one would apply to anyone merging slides from multiple presentations into their corporate template. Um, for you in, in your case, what I would suggest are if I'm not sure if you're locked down based on all of the corporate brand, but this new design ideas uh, feature and it's AI based um, when you open up PowerPoint and you just drop in slides 
it will actually suggest some design ideas. And I've been creating some amazing presentations using the design ideas. It's under the design tab and then to the right is all the way it's called design ideas. Hmm. So you can take like a, a list, an agenda, just take a basic, you can try it. Everyone can try it right now. Take a, a, a basic agenda, put four things on the agenda in a slide in PowerPoint, go to design tab, click on design ideas, and PowerPoint will give you a, about eight different ideas, including with images and things like that. And it's just brilliant. Wow. Um, I just created a LinkedIn presentation based on that probably within 30 minutes. And it's beautiful. And I, I love data. I don't like design. Like I wear black and red all the time. So I'm just <laughs> not a designer, but it came out really well. The, the LinkedIn presentation. Hmm. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Well, um, Vicki, what's maybe a tip that you would share speaking to the executives um, on how to empower their assistants and really equip their assistants with technology? So right now, I'm sure a lot of executives are hearing this term called digital transformation, and which is about taking you from where you are to where you want to go. And um, there's this new trend that there's a lot of money being spent investing in taking teams um, and transforming their digital skills. And, and it's, it's how we're going to all reach our full potential and overachieve in this ever changing world of technology and digital skills. Cause again, we don't know what's, what's being built right now in someone's garage. Um, there's a book called the digital helix that I really love and it's all about digital transformation so um, with, with this, I would identify what the digital skills are for the role and not only for the current role, but what's coming and then provide your assistant and the assistant team and your staff, the resources and the time to make their digital transformations. Um, and that's the only way for us to uh, eliminate waste, the wasted time it takes to do something, the redundant work that we're all doing, the potential risks um, in manual processes. We absolutely need to improve efficiency in our organizations and technology is the way to do that. Uh, right now, given the fact that we're only using 10 to 30 percent of an application's capabilities, let's say an organization is spending $100,000 on technology. So for every $100,000 in technology being spent, that means $70,000 to $90,000 of that investment is being wasted hmm. because we're only using an average of 10 to 30%. So we need to invest in digital transformation and improving digital skills for our staff. Hmm. Love it. What, what makes an assistant a leader? What makes an assistant a leader? You know what? I think um, seeing an opportunity, the ones that I interact with all the time that call me and um, are making a difference in creating high performing teams, they're the ones that are seeking, seeing an opportunity to help the business and seizing on it. And they are seeing the opportunity to improve the digital transformation, improve digital skills. And then identifying the ROI, like what are the business goals, uh, whether it's improving productivity, improving morale, turn, re, uh, reducing turnover, reducing risk, improving the brand, improving the image. They're identifying those value drivers that impact the bottom line, and they're creating those the ROI models and um, suggested time savings in order to bring improve these digital skills and they're seizing it they're they're putting together lunch and learns and identifying subject matter experts like if if Jessica is an expert in um, PowerPoint then that Jessica is leading a lunch and learn if the next person loves V lookups then you know Sarah is teaching V lookups in the next lunch and learn so they seize an opportunity they see an opportunity and they seize it that to me is what makes an assistant a leader from a digital transformation or technology perspective. Great. 
Awesome, Vicky. Well, thanks so much for sharing your tips and, and your wisdom and a little bit of your story. Uh, where can we find you online and how can we support what you're up to? Yeah, absolutely. I really appreciate the opportunity, Jeremy. Um, so I'm the my name of the company is the Red Cape Company. So it's redcapeco.com. And then all the social media um, sites are Red Cape Co. So Instagram, Red Cape Co., YouTube, Twitter, Red Cape Co. Perfect. Yeah. Great. Well, I'll put those links in the show notes uh, so people Thank can you. Ch- say hi and, and follow what you're up to. And yeah, thanks again. And we will talk soon. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Jeremy. And thanks, everybody. Thanks, Vicki, for a great episode. You can check out the show notes at leaderassistant.com slash 60. And we will talk to you next week. And reminder to check out my free three chapters of the book, leaderassistantbook.com. Talk soon. Please review on Apple Podcasts. GoBullos.com